Welkom terug. Graag kondig ik John Robinson aan als tweede spreker. John is van huis uit de geograaf, maar hij introduceert zichzelf altijd liever als undisciplined scientist. Hij is hoogleraar duurzame ontwikkeling aan de Universiteit van British Columbia in Vancouver. Sinds de Olympische Spelen weten we allemaal dat dat in Canada ligt. Uh, Bridger is zijn tweede naam. En ik, uh, ik denk, volgens mij is er geen toepasselijker naam voor iemand als uh, John Robinson. Want hij, in zijn werk is hij constant bezig om bruggen te bouwen over en tussen disciplines en tussen de wetenschap en andere werelden. Hij is specialist op het terrein van toekomstverkenning en wordt internationaal gezien als grondlegger van wat uh, backcasting wordt genoemd. Terugdenken vanuit de toekomst. John is betrokken bij diverse projecten op het grensvlak van duurzaamheid, maatschappelijke verandering en burgerparticipatie. En sinds kort heeft hij een nieuwe baan, of ernaast eigenlijk, als executive director van het Sustainability Initiative van UBC. Wat heel erg spannend is, want gepoogd wordt om het soort onderzoek waar John ook vanmiddag over zal vertellen, echt in de praktijk te brengen. En om de campus, waar dagelijks 50.000 mensen rondlopen, om daar echt een duurzame local community van te maken. En hij is daar verantwoordelijk voor. John werkte mee aan de laatste drie rapporten van het Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, de IPCC. En daardoor deelt hij dus in de Nobelprijs voor de Vrede die in 2007 aan de IPCC werd toegekend. In tegenstelling tot vele anderen die zich daarna wel eens gewenteld hebben in zelfgenoegzaamheid, uh, is hij ook voor de storm der kritiek altijd kritisch gebleven op de organisatie waar hij zelf een bijdrage aan leverde. In zijn optiek is de IPCC een orgaan die het moeilijk vindt zijn eigen werkwijze te accepteren, Waardoor het moeilijk, wat het moeilijk maakt om op de lange termijn maatschappelijk relevant te blijven. Vandaag gaat het echter niet over de IPCC, maar over keuzes en dilemma's die samenhangen met een duurzame toekomst. It's a great pleasure and an honor to ask John Robinson to deliver his lecture. Thank you, Marjolein, uh, for your, what I assume was a very generous introduction, but of course, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> it could have been anything. Uh, it's, it is a great pleasure to be here. It's one of my favorite parts of the world to visit, so I like to try and get to the Netherlands uh, once a year or so. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about some issues that are fairly close to my heart and to some of the work that we're doing uh, in Vancouver. So what I'd like to do is uh, three things, really. Uh, some preliminary marks just to really set up the kind of work that we've been doing um, in sort of participatory, normative, backcasting exercises with local communities, uh, mostly in our region of the world. Then I'm going to work with you to create a scenario using one of the modeling tools we've developed over the past 10 or 15 years, which is a computer game-like simulation tool that uh, we, we use with uh, various stakeholders and publics called MetroQuest. So we're gonna, we only have a little time, so we'll do a, a little bit of a, of a scenario creation exercise. These normally last three or four hours. Uh, we're gonna do it in 20 minutes, so it's gonna be a subset of the whole, but it hopefully give you a flavor of the kinds of things we do to engage citizens in thinking about the future. And then close, uh, as with Angela, with some reflections. Uh, about uh, the, a way forward and how we can uh, move uh, more actively in the direction of engaging many more people in thinking about the future of their region, their city, uh, their neighborhood. The context for what I'm going to say is, is several things. I want to take from the out-of-sight report that they are produced in September, I think, uh, by the way, an excellent report. Uh, if, uh, again, I've only read the English summary version of it. Um, but I want to take a few things from, from that report because I think they really set up what I want to say very nicely. The idea that the future is open but not empty, I think this is actually a fairly profound insight uh, that is worth uh, elaborating on. And I think Angela's remarks are very consistent with this insight as well. The idea that uncertainty is more than uh, what's called in that report cognitive uncertainty. We have a bunch of uncertainty about social and normative issues. 
And this uh, results from the fact that within the field of observation, unlike uh, climate uh, modeling, climate science, or much uh, other science, within the field of observation of the social sciences are human consciousness, consciousnesses which have volition and intentionality. That changes the nature of the whole exercise in a fairly fundamental way. So I want to say a little bit about that. This concept of the arena perspective where we're really trying to juggle uh, uh, different views and Angela has given you some really uh, powerful examples of the degree to which the framing of the problem can change the whole nature of the diagnosis and the proposed solution. And then what's called a blind spot in that report about normative participatory uh, future studies because I think there's a real opportunity uh, for, for in that area. The Netherlands of 2040 report, I just want to take from that, we were, we were sent a lot of material in advance of this lecture, um, the, the focus on cities. Our work has really um, led us to the conclusion that the fundamental spatial scale for even global issues like climate change is increasingly below the national level. Now, of course, in our country, below the national level is a lot farther below, spatially speaking, than it is in the Netherlands. Nevertheless, the question of where the locus of agency is and the most, most powerful and potent kind of agency that can be exercised is a very interesting one. And the failure of the COP process, the Conference of the Parties process at the international level, uh, has led a lot of people to suggest that really the interesting activity in areas like climate change is happening at a more local level. And uh, we've certainly found in Canada it's very depressing to deal with the national government on climate change. Uh, it's way more interesting to deal with our provincial government and our municipalities. So focus on cities. Um, and then from a report I was just given uh, the night before last, and which again I only was able to read the English summary of, uh, uh, about foreign policy in the Netherlands and the future of foreign policy. Um, this concept of the network world, which we're increasingly moving into, we only have to turn to our children to see a completely different set of social relationships and behaviors that are derived from this highly interconnected form of uh, interaction that happens through social media. Uh, the, the concept of a transparent deliberation framework, I think that is exactly the kind of thing that I'm going to be arguing for. And then the question, the question Angela as well asked and that I want to ask as well, what kind of world do we want to live in? And then finally, there's too many things to pick. I didn't have much room at the bottom of the slide from Angela's presentation. But this idea of learning with, not about the future, this is really a fundamental shift in perspective from thinking there's something out there that we can describe, uncover, and see to uh, thinking that it's a process of learning as much about us now as, uh, as about the future. Examining assumptions, scenarios as mental maps, as tools, framing tools, uh, where do we want to take the future? That's, in a way, that question lies behind everything I'm going to say. I want to expand a little bit on the distinction Angela made uh, near the beginning of her presentation, the distinction between trying to predict the future, which is still, by the way, the regulative ideal. In fact, a normative ideal within much of uh, the scientific community is the idea that prediction equals understanding. And therefore, the goal is to converge on likelihood. We want to find the most likely future, and that's the base case. That's the one that will happen if nothing else occurs. Um, uh, that distinction between that and scenarios is well known. Scenarios is about multiple f futures. The key point here is these are typically incommensurable. They are not reducible to each other. Not, they're not variants of the base case. They're actually fundamentally different logics um, and they're not derivable from each other. This, this is the, in some ways the basic insights of scenario analysis. What I want to add to that is a third approach which we've been trying to work with for the past 20 years or so, of talking about how to get to desirable futures. Let's make this whole exercise more explicitly normative. I would argue it's always normative. It's just that the normative nature is usually hidden in a predictive framing. Um, let's make this more explicitly normative and start talking about desirability of futures, not simply, uh, well, certainly not simply likelihood, but not even uh, multiplicity. And so, the question is, how do we make operational this third approach? And that's been a lot of the work we've been doing over the last few decades. I want to say a word or two about uncertainty, and I want to use the example of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. 
because it's such a perfect case study of this issue. Um, what we have in IPCC um, is three working groups. Everybody's familiar with the working group one on the science of climate change itself, working group two on impacts and adaptation, and working group three on mitigation. What's maybe less appreciated is these are completely different communities with very different center of gravity disciplinary expertise. We have the natural science, physical science community is, is, makes up almost all of working group one. Working group two has a preponderance of ecologists and biologists and uh, sort of uh, environmental science. Working group three is the catch-all for all the other social sciences um, and uh, a lot of economists as well. Now, whether econ economics is a social science or not, I'll leave you to decide. But uh, you have the scenario work uh, on the emissions side happening in working group three. Now, what happened is very interesting. In the second assessment report and uh, third, and especially in the fourth, what we had was this huge process of trying to say, let's have a common approach to uncertainty so that the language between the three reports is the same because there was a response from various audiences, governments, saying you're saying different things in these reports about uncertainty. It's incommensurable. We can't relate them to each other. So a, quite a large process was started. The massive email blitz went around, meetings and discussions to try and come up with a common framework for uncertainty. This basically failed, in my view, uh, despite the attempt to put a good face on it and have a language that was consistent across the reports. It doesn't work very well. And I think the reason it doesn't is we're talking about three different ways of thinking about uncertainty. One based on likelihood, one based on confidence, one based on choice. Likelihood is about probabilistic assessment of what the world is like. What, do we, what is our best judgment of the probability of outcome being, uh, or what the probability of a given outcome is. And the working group one tended, I'm oversimplifying here, but tended to adopt more of a likelihood approach to thinking about the future of climate systems. The environmental scientists tended to focus a little more, and this is just my anecdotal impression, on the confidence question. How much confidence do we have in any statement about the future? That's a different thing, because that's locating uncertainty in the head of the scientists, not in the world. It is a rather different. In, if you read the reports, you'll see that these two are conflated, and both kinds of statements are now in the reports. But they mean different things, and different communities were promoting them. Now, I'm going to focus on a subgroup in working group three, which was the scenarios people. I was conveniently the author of the, of the scenarios chapter in the third assessment report. And basically, what we were doing was saying, this is the wrong question. Confidence or likelihood. If we're talking about socioeconomic systems with humans in them, with intentionality and volition, likelihood is not a very useful concept. And confidence is not something we can express. We can't even predict quarterly GDP three months out. So we're talking about 100-year scenarios? I mean, prediction is not a very useful way to think in, those, in that context. So uh, as many people know, the whole special report on emission scenarios ended up taking a scenarios approach that said there's four fundamentally different futures. They can't be reduced to each other or expressed in terms of each other. They're just different worlds. And to some extent, it's a question of choice. Not entirely, but to some extent. That's very different than cloud physics, where we don't usually impute a whole bunch of choice to what's going on up there. Maybe, maybe it is, but not available to us. So uh, socioeconomic systems, maybe uh, confidence and probability aren't the best ways to think about uncertainty. I want to pick up on this idea of choice because it underlies the work we do. Um, and uh, I'll be following that theme through a little bit. If it's about choice, that raises the question, who chooses? This leads us to the, an argument for a need for a very participatory approach to scenario analysis. Scenario analysis that is not just communicated out to the public and stakeholders, but scenario analysis that actually involves the participants, the audience, in the creation of the scenarios themselves. Um, uh, this is a very familiar list of the reasons we might want to think about more participatory approaches. There are normative reasons. People have a right to be involved in the discussion about futures that are going to affect them. That's a pretty obvious reason for participatory approaches. There are substantive reasons, however, as well. There's certainly an argument that a more participatory process, in principle, increases the quality of the decisions because it brings into the analysis 
uh, information that is not available to the, to the scholars and the experts doing, say, creating the scenarios. First of all, ethical and political input, which actually isn't the province of the, of the expert anyway. Most experts try to remove that dimension from their work. If we're going to have deeply ethical, ethically laden and political decisions made, we need input from the people that uh, are going to be affected and who have some, we all have a say in those issues as citizens. Local knowledge also is a, another input. And finally, a set of instrumental reasons uh, for participatory approaches, which actually I think are becoming more and more important as our world fragments into anger and mistrust. And we see this happening across the planet uh, in every country, certainly the Netherlands, certainly Canada. Uh, uh, levels of mistrust and anger that are historically unprecedented, at least in the last uh, few decades. Um, in, th in those circumstances especially, uh, we need processes that are going to allow people to be somehow feel part of it and more likely therefore to buy into the result of it. If people feel imposed upon uh, by various kinds of elites, um, then they're, they're resistant in principle. Can we create processes that are going to lead to enough sense of buy-in and ownership that the results of the process will be more widely accepted? That's the opportunity, I think, the instrumental opportunity for more participatory processes. This has led us to what we call second-order backcasting. First-order backcasting was we, we, the researchers, would identify some desirable future and do an analysis of how to get there. Um, as I've just said, we're trying to move this in a more participatory direction. So really what we're trying to do is combine scenario, traditional scenario analysis with backcasting in these kinds of participatory processes where we don't start with an uh, articulated desired future. We start with a set of goals. And those goals have to reflect the audience. So we start with a process of eliciting what the goals are from the people such as this group here in this room. Um, and those goals uh, are, don't define outcomes, they define a kind of color of the future, in this case, uh, green. <laughs> Um, so uh, we have a set of goals. I don't know why it was green, it just somehow I picked green. Um, and we start a process then of creating scenarios. We take a scenario into the future and we see where it takes us. And then we compare. Is that future consistent with the goals? In this case, obviously not. The, the goals are green, the future is red. So we keep doing that and we iterate, we keep iterating through scenario creation until we get to a future that's consistent with our goals. That's the one we want. That becomes our objective. Now we can look at ways to get there from here. So you see the crucial component here of, uh, of, of aligning the scenario with the goal and having the goals emerge out of the process rather than be imposed from outside. This, in turn, leads us to a procedural definition of sustainability. You all know that sustainability is one of these essentially contested concepts. It has many, many different definitions. There are certain people who think that's a problem with the concept of sustainability. I think the opposite. We've managed to get by in, for 2,000 years with multiple concepts of truth, justice, democracy, and somehow that hasn't impeded us from developing legal systems and political systems. I think sustainability is one of those kinds of concepts. It's an essentially contested concept, and the contestation is part of the process of deciding where you want to be. So we define sustainability uh, in the light of that kind of approach as an emergent property. It isn't a scientific concept. Sustainability is fundamentally a normative ethical concept, in our view, um, that is itself emergent from a process at a process of discussion, of dialogue, among whatever community is involved. But that dialogue is informed, this is where the science comes in, by some understanding of the higher order consequences and trade-offs associated with different choices, the ecological, economic, and social consequences and trade-offs of different courses of action. This is crucial, courses of action. These are the choices we have. We have, we have significant choice, and those choices give rise to different consequences. And that, in turn, informs the discussion of what kind of future we want to have. In other words, sustainability and desirability uh, conflate to some degree. I've never met in many years of doing this uh, anybody argue for unsustainability. It hasn't happened yet. Now, maybe there are people who argue for it. I've never met anyone. What we argue about is what we mean by sustainability and what is indeed sustainable. 
That's good. That's exactly the argument we need to have. That's the discussion that we require, is what set of outcomes are acceptable? Under what trade-offs are we willing to make? Put another way, we see a need to take expert understanding on the one hand, which is located partly in the academies, the universities, and partly in industry, partly in government, lots of certified expertise, and combine it with public attitudes, values, norms, uh, perceptions, and beliefs by the creation of processes and tools that bring these two kinds of understanding together and give rise to this emergent property of potentially some kind of agreement on where we want to go. So that's the promise. This is the ideal. Of course, reality is a little bit more messy than that. That means we need some tools that allow this, these two forms of knowledge to be combined. We want to locate our tools uh, in between the world of models, the quantification of, of outcomes, which is crucial to this kind of exercise, because otherwise it's just conversation. Um, I say just conversation, that's a little unfair, but it's conversation uninformed by any, uh, any technical analysis of, of consequences and trade-offs. So we want some modeling, but people don't live in model land. In our normal everyday life, even we, uh, the, the academics who are much more uh, focused on this kind of analysis than anyone else in the world, even we in our normal lives don't sit down with our partners and, and do a cost-benefit analysis of our relationship, right? It's just not kind of how we live our life. Instead, we live our life in story land, in narrative land. We tell stories to each other about our relationships or about our friends. That's exactly the medium of exchange for the whole planet from the dawn of time. And yet, we think somehow these purely technical analyses can translate directly into lived experience of individuals that don't have technical training. It doesn't happen. When we show people charts and diagrams, uh, uh, their eyes glaze over in about 10 seconds. It's not communicating in a way that's meaningful to them. So we need to deal with narrative. Narrative is the way in which we can engage people much more deeply. We try to locate our tools in between the world of models and the world of stories. So, for example, on the interface, and you'll see it in a few minutes, no number ever appears. We try to have a purely qualitative interface. Underneath the hood is all kinds of uh, algorithmic calculation, but uh, the, the, uh, the dashboard is qualitative. What's the challenge here? The modeling challenge. I want to quote from someone Angela uh, knows well. Um, uh, Pierre Vac, 1985, two famous articles in Harvard Business Review, said something very profound, I think. Actually, they're wonderful articles even today. Uh, the purpose of modeling isn't to describe the world, it's to change the mental models in the heads of the audience. That's a really interesting idea. What are the, and and the, you heard Angela talk ex actually just about this question. What are these mental models? How do we bring them out and examine them, unpack them, try to understand them? Then we met with John Hiles. John Hiles ran a company called Thinking Tools, which was the business division of Maxis Corporation. You know, SimCity, SimEarth, all the Sim games. And he, he did business simulations. He built Sim Refinery for Chevron, Sim Health for the healthcare system in the US. And he said something really interesting. Most people in our culture are alienated from the large systems. The large systems, technology, politics, economics. They're alienated from them not because of lack of information, the Sunday New York Times has more information on all those systems every week than anyone can absorb. There's no lack of information, but it isn't actually information to most people, it's just noise. And it's noise because we don't have a mental model to make sense of it. So interest rates go up. If we understand a bit of economics, we might understand what's going on. Otherwise, what do we do? We rely on the columnist that we like to explain it to us. And we might like that columnist because he's kind of handsome, or we might like him for reasons that have nothing to do with economics, but that's who we'll turn to, because we don't have a mental model to explain that phenomenon. And we can't have expert models on most phenomena in society, so we depend on others. This, if you combine these two quotes, you see this huge opportunity it's for tools that will give people mental models to make sense out of noise. Sense-making is a term that I know Angela likes. But always remember Neil Postman's warning back uh, many years ago, information is the garbage of the 1990s. I think that warning holds true uh, this decade as well. Okay, the, all of this is background to uh, the tool we built called MetroQuest. 
Quest used to stand for Quasi-Understandable Ecosystem Scenario Tool. It was an acronym. Uh, we hope we were trying to turn it into a quite useful ecosystem scenario tool, and you can judge whether we have achieved that. Uh, the company that does this, my two ex-grad students now have a company that does commercial applications. We've sold the software to 18 cities around North America. So there's quite a bit of experience now of using this in, at an urban scale. Um, and now I want to walk you through. We're going to imagine we're doing a MetroQuest session. Unfortunately, we've only done North American cities, so this will be a little different kind of context. So I'm going to start with a few context slides to just give you a feel for the kind of issues we grapple with. We didn't have a Hog Metro Quest or an Amsterdam Metro Quest uh, to show to you. Um, so this is the very southern tip of Vancouver Island off the west coast of British Columbia, and that's where our capital city is, right at the bottom right of the screen there. And unlike most European cities, uh, but like most Canadian cities, we're growing a lot. We expect about a 35% growth in population by 2038. That's completely migration driven. We're below natural fertility in our uh, uh, population in, within Canada. So that's entirely migration driven. But it's a big growth in a small period of time. This, by the way, is what most of the planet is doing outside Europe, Japan, and parts of North America. So it's an interesting question about uh, sustainability and what's applicable where. Anyway, uh, how do we plan for a 33% uh, increase? Our, this is the land area available for uh, putting more people and houses and roads and infrastructure. But when you start to subtract off the things that you can't build on, like water and steep slopes or sensitive ecosystems, Gary Oak is a protected species in BC, parks, Greenlands, First Nation reserves, airports, renewable resource lands, uh, the agricultural land reserves set aside for farming, and then the built up areas. You can see that the actual amount of land area available is rather smaller. So I, w I always hope this would make you feel like this is more like a Dutch situation. Constrained, you had not a lot of room to grow, despite your impression of Canada as this infinite expanse. Uh, lots of it isn't very expandable into. So here's the challenge. There's the land area available. We've got to add 110,000 people. How do we do it? This is what we take out to the public and talk to them about land use, about transportation, about urban density, about jobs, about energy use, and so on, and try and figure out if there's a way forward that works for people. So what I'm going to now do, I hope, is take you to the software. This is the software, which you can actually see on the web now. Um, uh, this is the actual game itself, uh, MetroQuest for Victoria. And wh what we do is, is four things, three main ones. We choose some priorities, then we make some choices, and we see the outcomes. So here's the priorities. And what we do, if, if we had the time, we'd spend a lot of time deciding, here's 15 possible priorities. What matters to you? Can the group reach consensus on the top five priorities for their uh, group? And I managed to leave behind the sheet of paper that said which one. Thanks. I'm not, we don't have time to do all that and have that discussion and vote on them all individually. So I'm actually going to choose um, uh, five priorities for you and ask you to vote on your top priority. So. We'll go back to the, uh, oh, sorry about that. Okay, you recognize the little numbers on the screen, so I'm going to ask you to vote on, and just to give you a little explanation, just pick one. So pick a number from one to five, which is your most important priority? I've thrown one in here that might not be a typical Dutch priority, but you might recognize it as a more typical North American priority, but I just thought I'd give you the chance to be North American if you wanted to and, and choose. I think you can guess which one it is. Um, so you pick one, just one vote for the one you think is the most important priority, and you can start doing that now. Okay. 
Okay, it's slowing down. Okay, we'll cut it off. All right, now this is where I have to make a little. So more green space, what a surprise, is number one. Number two is quiet neighborhoods. Wait, I should have done my prediction of your volts to uh, low carbon emissions. Number three, uh, and lower cost of living, number four. And not too many dyed in the wool North American sensibilities in this room. <laughs> it's actually the, the full one is large homes with big yards, but I thought that was taking it too far in this audience, so <laughs> I just stuck with large homes. Okay, so we're going to now choose, and you can imagine the kind of discussion. Normally, the room like this with this many people would be in tables, and so there'd be tables of eight or ten who would sit and discuss priorities, and each table might get one vote, for example. So there's a collective process of decision-making. So more green space, boy. That would have been my prediction. Uh, lower cost of living. Okay, so this now becomes, for the sake of argument, your priorities in order of preference, okay? So at this point, we will move on to making some choices. Having set the priorities, uh, we now can make some choices. And we're going to make choices in two areas. We're going to make choices, of, but there's only two questions here. Uh, where we develop, okay? do we want to mostly have this new growth in population and infrastructure and so on happen in new areas, those black parts uh, of the screen you saw earlier? So we want to actually develop uh, mostly outside the existing urban environment. Do we want, on the other hand, to densify, to really try and put as many of these people as possible into existing built-up areas or some kind of mixture. And you can see the pictures illustrate to a, some degree, there we go, there's that North American suburban house uh, that we all love, uh, uh, or a slightly more dense or significantly more dense population. So that'll be the first choice. Your second choice will be on transportation. Some versions of MetroQuest have up to six choices on different issues. This one just has two, uh, which I chose because we don't have much time. So do we focus our investment mainly in improving the road system? Remember, we're adding 35% to the population. That's a significant number of new people. Do we want to improve the road system, which is already arguably inadequate to support the existing level of drivers? Do we want, on the other hand, to really focus on transit? penalize drivers and try and uh, encourage them <laughs> through bad service on the roadside to uh, take more transit. Uh, that's a phenomenon you may be familiar with. Um, or some kind of mix where we really have to uh, respect the God-given right of everyone to drive as much as they want, but we also want good transit. So those are your choices. We're going to start um, with... Let's go back now this time. We're going to start with where we encourage new development. Okay, so there's your three choices. You can start voting now. And imagine that you've been sitting at a table discussing for maybe half an hour this choice with a group of 10 other people trying to think through the consequences of that. Okay, cut it off there. Okay, wow, again. What a surprise. I think you are, you are, as an audience, in the right part of the world. <laughs> if you're planning an, a move to a certain continent a little bit to the left on the map, you might have to rethink some of your attitudes. <laughs> okay, um, this is maybe a foregone conclusion, but now you get to vote on where we put our transportation dollars. Roads, all modes, or transit focused. You can start. Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to cut you off there if I can find my. Hey, okay. <laughs> All right. Oops. Okay, so we have now picked existing areas and transit development. Okay, um, at, that, at this point, uh, we've made all the input choices. As I said, you can have versions of MetroQuest with more. This is one that just has two. So we can now go and look at the outcomes. The outcomes occur in a couple of different forms. First of all is the map, um, which is uh, a map uh, well, in this panel in the middle here, we have a map that shows how um, things change over time. So you can see a little bit of change happening there in the map. You can uh, also look at a bunch of other indicators, which we don't have time to, to go through. So that, the first thing you can do is see the spatial implications of your choice. And you can zoom in and get a sense of what has changed. You've chosen the least new development, but you can see the density increase happening over time as I, as I go back to today and up to 2046. So you really have densified those urban cores by the choices you made. What you can also see over here on the screen is your five priorities and how you did. Okay, and what you can see is you did pretty well on three of them, but you did pretty badly on two of them. Two got worse. It's noisier because you've densified, and uh, you just didn't get those large homes that you really wanted to have uh, in this scenario. But you lowered the cost of living. The reason you lowered the cost of living is denser infrastructure is more cost effective to build. Um, this is, in our experience, a somewhat an unanticipated consequence. People don't make the connection between density and taxes, for example. Uh, although once it's pointed out and you walk through these things, people can understand those links. Lower carbon emissions, of course, is also a function of density. So that's our priorities. You can also look at other people's potential priorities. From an urban lifestyle point of view, gee, this is a pretty good scenario. Not surprisingly, because you put all the money into the, uh, into the cores. But the suburbs hate this. Right? It really doesn't do them any good. This is an important point. Not everybody is happy with every outcome. From a travel point of view, it's way better because you've densified and there's smaller distances. Environment, not so bad, mostly positive. And from a cost point of view as well. So you're very virtuous in terms of several of the outcomes here. Um, you can, as I said, today the, the, it's always the diamond in the middle and then you can see how that changes over time. You can also compare uh, your scenario to uh, the present. Um, and you can also zoom in and zoom out as well on that. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of what you can do. At this point in the, in the process, um, you would have had been having a lot of discussion with your table mates and then collectively in the room. And you would then have the chance to do the ne next big thing. So we chose priorities, we made choices. The third big step is to iterate. So maybe you don't like this outcome. You don't like the consequences when you start looking at some of the, uh, some of the outcomes and you think, gee, I didn't expect that. I, I really don't like that. So at this point, you have the opportunity to play, to change the choices and see the outcomes. This used to take, in the first version of Quest, it took six hours uh, to run. Uh, we got it down to about two minutes. Now it's zero time because we've pre-run all the scenarios. It's just really a lookup table at this point. But the scenarios were nevertheless created. So you can actually play and iterate until you get to a scenario that the room in general is most happy with. That finishes step three, and that can take quite a bit of time of discussion. Step four is actually the most interesting part. That's where you turn all this technology off and you say, how do we get there from here? That's not in the model. That's entirely in the discussion. And that's where the dialogue becomes the most informative because you've now got a common sense of trade-offs and consequences, the effects of doing this or the effects of doing that. You may disagree on what you like, but at least you have that sort of common framework. Now let's talk about how. And that's the really uh, good part of the discussion. So let's go back. Now, 
Now, we do these kinds of, work, these kinds of exercises using three ch channels or modes. One is workshops, and here's the four steps I talked about. We have our button boxes have gotten a little smaller than the ones you've used. Uh, the advantage of the ones you're using is you're probably not going to walk home with them in your pocket because they're too big and bulky, but we tend to lose those little ones uh, out of just uh, people not paying attention. So there's the workshop process. That's about a half a day. And you can run dozens of workshops, but you can't run hundreds of workshops. The other way is on the web. So Chicago, our MetroQuest in Chicago, uh, which was uh, paid for by the Metropolitan Planning Authority of Chicago, put this on the web, uh, and you could visit 2040, and we'd show simulations of how Chicago would develop. Uh, you could invent 2040, and here you can see they have five choices down the left of that screen, so they had more variation, more possibility, um, and deposit your preferred scenario in, and then you could compare your scenario to other people's scenario and to the official scenarios of different uh, organs of government. So that becomes an interactive process of learning and depositing. And by the way, the central goal here is it's easy, you know, polls give you 10 seconds and no context to answer complex public policy problems over the phone when the kids are crying and you'd rather be doing something else. Uh, a workshop like this gives you three hours to learn about those same problems. And so what you deposit at the end of that process is in principle a much more useful expression of your values and your preferences than you can ever give in a poll. So we think that the government by poll is problematic for all the reasons we all know about, that these processes can be a more useful input to, uh, to, to decision making. And then we have it in kiosks. So we had five kiosks around the city of Chicago uh, and people could come and play MetroQuest for a minute or two and walk away. There were 500 people a day at, these, at the busy kiosk playing this over, a, the, it was the summer of 2009. Here's the numbers. We had about 1,500 people in workshops because we ran 50 workshops in Chicago. That's a lot of, in, that takes a lot of money and time to run 50 workshops. It's not a trivial exercise. You only get 1,500. Um, we, we used the workshops to try and push people to the web. We, so we sent emails following up the workshop saying, you know, here's the website you can go to. 22% of the people opened their email, <laughs> which is apparently fairly high and that kind of a uh, thing. 5% um, clicked through and started to play MetroQuest online. We had 4,000 visitors online. And then a declining number went through to create a full scenario and leave it behind. But these are still significant numbers. 20,000 people played it at the kiosks. Now, think of that. We have, uh, you have, I'm sure, well, of course, the Netherlands, consensus land, you have millions of workshops going on all the time about everything under the sun. Uh, but do they ever attain politically significant numbers of people? Typically not. And typically, it's the old STP phenomenon that uh, we always hear about, same 10 people. You know, you go to the meeting, oh, there they are again. Uh, and there's people who go to meetings, and there's lots of people who don't. With these kind of kiosk and online opportunities, there is the possibility of engaging politically significant numbers of, uh, of a particular community. That turns it into a whole different ballgame uh, with respect to potential impact on policy. If you can start to reach. Now, there is a quality-quantity trade-off here that the, 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 the bigger numbers are in much shorter experiences, so there's a question. But anyway, it's a new world, I think, with the technology. Okay, let me end with some, uh, some reflections on, on the question of crisis, a, a really simple-minded conceptual framework I want to put forward, where I see some of the frontiers of this work, an example of what we're trying to do, and a cautionary endpoint. This whole question of crisis, as we heard in the first half of today, uh, is a kind of interesting and sometimes problematic way to think about uh, the issue. Um, as we know, everybody's crisis is someone else's opportunity. Uh, it depends a lot on the temporal and spatial scales, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, crisis by its nature is, is a short-term concept, but if you take a 10-year uh, perspective, it might be rather different. It might be a different kind of crisis. And always the, the question to ask, I think, is qui bono? Who benefits? Who gains and who loses? Uh, that's always an informative question to ask from the framing of things as crises. Who benefits from that? Who loses from that? And from the policies that follow. 
I think the psychology of motivation is very important here. We sometimes think we need a crisis to get action because people are so mired in their, uh, you know, resistance to change. I think that's a misunderstanding of our culture, by the way. I think we're the most change-prone culture in the history of humanity. Uh, but nevertheless, there's this feeling that people are resistant to change. But, and so crisis will allow us to make the transition. Uh, in fact, I think it's kind of the opposite. Crisis leads to very short-term thinking, defensive thinking, reactive thinking, and, and it does indeed create change, but the change is hardly ever strategic and, and uh, enlightened and long-term. Uh, just think of the last number of natural disasters around the world and what the response has been to them and say how many of them have been long-term thinking uh, and how many are just trying to solve an immediate uh, serious problem. Opportunity, most of the social benefits put in place in the Western world since 1945 to at least till 1980 when things began to unravel uh, were put in place at times of rising expectations and rising welfare. Uh, so it's not clear that crisis is the right framing for thinking about progressive change. Here's a really simple framework uh, that we use to think about navigating the future. Uh, Choice is the fundamental point. There is real choice. It's not a juggernaut coming down on us to which we have to respond. It's something that we can exercise some choice. But there is indeed uncertainty of the cognitive kind and of the kind that I was criticizing earlier. And there are constraints. Not everything is available. This is just an elaboration of the open but not uh, empty concept. This is the, inter to me, the interesting question is let's identify the ones that are still left there and start to make some decisions about which direction we want to go. I think that means we need tools that are dynamic uh, over time, that are integrated and are participatory. These are the characteristics. And think of the models that are now used to look at the future, how many of them uh, meet those three conditions. From our work, I think there's some preliminary lessons. We get incredible enthusiasm from the public when we go out with this stuff. People are really interested in talking about their community. Scale is important. It's not the country. It's not the province. It's their city. Uh, uh, temporal scale is important. 100 years doesn't work. 40 years works. We chose 40 years because it allowed capital turnover, turnover of capital stock, which you need to get big change. But it worked for people, not for that reason, but because they could imagine their kids in 40 years. That was the, the most fundamental factor. Or they were young enough that they'd still be working in 40 years. And so 40 years worked for us. Um, and people got very engaged. Interactivity is crucial. Don't create scenarios and give them to people. Let them create the scenarios. That's one of the biggest things we found, is that's when the buy-in is much higher at this local level. Visualization, I'm gonna say a word about that. We have too high credibility. I'm worried with the white coat syndrome, people believe this stuff too much. They're not as critical. So we have to be careful. Um, uh, we see increased knowledge and engagement in some of the uh, evaluation work we've done. Collective agency, a sense of collective agency. Arguably, our, our world today is really lacking in a sense of collective agency. We're fragmenting. And so how do we create more collective agency? Ethical dimensions come to the fore when you have these discussions in context. Um, if you look at the literature in this area, there's some really interesting issues about qualitative and quantitative analysis, models versus stories, what we call true to life versus fun to use. It's got to be true to life or you're misleading people. It's got to be fun to use or they don't want to do it. There's a tension there, a really, really interesting. My two, first two grad students named themselves Mr. True to Life and Mr. Fun to Use, and that was the tension. Um, it, uh, this becomes a method of communicating complexity but it's typically unconnected to policy. All these big projects are done and then they die. People get their expectations up, nothing happens. How we connect this to policy is a, a really big issue. I won't talk too much about this, but there's a bunch of frontiers, I think, of where we can go. I'm interested in performing, performing arts as a way to engage with this stuff. I wanna say a, one word about landscape visualization because we're moving more and more in this direction. As I said, people's eyes glaze over with charts and tables. Show them a landscape and they're there. They're right there and they read them in very sophisticated ways. We are quite sophisticated in our understanding of landscapes. All of us are. And so you, now, in fact, we're so sophisticated that when now you see this is cartoon-like, the reason it's cartoon-like 
is because Greenpeace got sued when they showed people climate change scenarios on real streetscapes. The property owner said, you've reduced the value of our property. So now everybody, you know, it's non-recognizable <laughs> streets. Um, so to show people uh, issues like climate change impacts or adaptation strategies, different adaptation strategies in a context they recognize. They can have very sophisticated discussions about this. There's not a chart or a table or a number to be seen, but the issue is there. This is about communicating complexity in user-friendly ways. Or even simpler, here is a, a typically highly attractive Vancouver uh, intersection, um, uh, and here is uh, an alternative version. You can have a three-hour workshop on that image. Everything's there. Renewable energy, live work, food production, uh, green space, transit, it's all there in ways people can understand and respond to. I want to almost end uh, by telling you briefly about a project we're just starting where we hope to engage tens of thousands of Vancouver citizens. We start with the public and the goals the city has declared, with their so-called greenest city goals, and we're going to set up five channels, workshops, mobile applications, tabletop games and kiosks, online events and performing arts, and so wrapping the whole thing in social media and different forms of invitation to engage in these different processes. The city is our partner in this. And then an evaluation process. We want to know who's invited and who plays, who engages in this stuff, how do they participate, how do the different medias and channels support their engagement, and then what do they say at the end of the process. We see an uh, opportunity to evaluate things like appeal of these different modes of engagement, dialogicality, do we really have dialogue going on, persistence over time, impact in both cognitive and non-cognitive ways, uh, and depth or level of commitment. That's on the evaluating of the modes of engagement, but we also want to evaluate the content people leave behind. What are they saying? What do people choose? And uh, what do they say about policy? So that's a project just getting started, and so I can say anything because we haven't done anything yet, and I can, I can make great claims for it. Uh, but in two years, we uh, will have done something. I want to end by returning to my opening slide and make the very simple point that everybody knows that if we're talking about the future and about changing the world and making choices, it's not just about the future. There's lots of things wrong today that we also need to change. And so future studies is present studies and has to be present studies, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for a very interesting and entertaining, I think, uh, talk. Uh, ik, ik hoop dat u al een uh, leerzame middag heeft gehad. Er zijn heel veel verschillende manieren om de WRR te typeren en te omschrijven. Eén daarvan is die van kennismakelaar. Waarbij wij proberen wetenschappelijke kennis op een aantrekkelijke manier in het Haagse te presenteren. En voor het voetlicht te brengen. Hopelijk hebben deze internationaal vermaarde wetenschappers u geïnspireerd. Om op een andere manier over het vraagstuk van de toekomst na te denken. En voor beide crisis te denken. Hopelijk heeft het u zowel uit de comfortzone gebracht en heeft het u tegelijkertijd inspiratie opgeleverd. Zover wat betreft de inhoud. Nu nog wat praktische opmerking ter afsluiting. We begrepen dat een aantal mensen die op de achterste banken zaten, de boekje waar Angela Wilkinson naar verwees, Beyond the Crisis, de Oxford scenario's, niet had. Uh, aangezien er door het slechte weer ongeveer 200 mensen niet gekomen zijn... Uh, hebben we nog wel boekjes over. Dus uh, degene die geen boekje hebben gehad, uh, trek ons straks even aan het jasje. Uh, verder uh, is er ook verwezen naar de studie uh, Uitzicht, toekomst verkennen met beleid. Uh, bij de uitgang ligt uh, nog een stapeltje en daar zit ook in uw uh, uh, folder zit een uh, bestelformulier. Verder zit er in de, in de tas die u bij de uitgang krijgt, zit het, uh, het boek van de, met de lezingen van vorig jaar en ook daarbij de DVD. Uh, vorig jaar was de titel van de lecture De Overheid als Keuzearchitect. En verder vindt u in de tas het boekje van of de WRR-publicatie Hoe mensen keuzes maken, wat echt net uit is. Dus uh, dat kunt u nog niet via andere wegen hebben gekregen. En afgelopen dinsdag is het, uh, er is ook al naar verwezen door verschillende sprekers, het WRR-rapport aan het buitenland gehecht, gepresenteerd. En bij de uitgang ligt voor degene van u die dit nog niet hebben en wel geïnteresseerd zijn, nog een stapeltje bij de uitgang. 
Namens de WRR wil ik nogmaals de sprekers bedanken voor hun, hun goed voorbereide, energieke en inspirerende verhalen. Ik wil alle aanwezigen danken voor uw echt actieve aanwezigheid vanmiddag. We konden steeds zien hoeveel mensen meestemden. En ik wil iedereen die voor en achter de schermen heeft geholpen om vanmiddag tot een succes te maken hartelijk bedanken. Dan rest mij nog de taak om u uit te nodigen voor de borrel. En ik denk dat het geen overbodige opmerking is om u een goede thuisreis te wensen en een fijne avond nog. Dank u wel voor uw komst en ik hoop dat u geniet van de borrel.